Thank you for joining us here. I'm joined with uh, Alberta Sequera and Tom Sirignano uh, talking about their upcoming uh, talk here at the library on February 6th from 6 to 8 p.m. on alcohol and addiction. Um, thank you both for joining us. Thank for Thanks for having us, Alan. Um, I guess we should start off by talking, um, I know you have a very long history um, you know, dealing with this in your family. You want to maybe start off by talking about uh, your early dealings with alcoholism and its effect on your family? Well, it took a long time for me even to write about it and talk about uh, in public about our life because back in the 70s, let's face it, what you did is you hid it. It was bad enough if you were, if you were divorced, but to tell people that you had an alcoholic problem, you really hid it. Um, I was really a young girl, I was 18 when I met my husband Richie, and there really weren't that much of signs of his drinking. Uh, I did say to my girlfriend once, because when I would meet him around the corner, you know how guys were, <laughs> back in those days, they had their cars and they shined them yeah. up, and he'd be <laughs> hanging out with his buddies, and they were always drinking, and I mm. didn't hang out with people that drank, and I said to my girlfriend, I'm a little worried about, he's always drinking, and she said, oh, Alberta, that's a macho thing <laughs> that, uh, men do. So he never drank when we dated, he never drank when we went to family gatherings. So I thought, well, maybe she's right, you know, he's just having fun with the guys. Um, but then we got married, we had, we had Debbie and Laurie, they were four years apart, and it, it took maybe about three years, and he had a job at the, uh, next door to the elbow room in Somerset, where that was a perfect thing for an alcoholic. And it was like I could turn a recorder on saying, geez, we had a tough day today. Oh, yeah. And, um, we're going to just go and have a few drinks and talk about business. So to make it short, it continued, uh, I would call my fault with enabling. I don't want people to think that if you're a enabler, you cause the person to drink. But to mm -hmm. me, you cause them to go deeper mm -hmm. into their drinking. And it led to where even Laurie, she, when she was two and Debbie was four, they listen to us fighting. I, in my book, Someone Stopped the Merry-Go-Round, um, what I did is open up with the reality mm -hmm. and the truth about why um, you really injure your children not meaning to keep them in that environment. Mm -hmm. And then after uh, Richie died, he died to me young, mm -hmm. 45, from his drinking, and I didn't realize why I was <coughs> on the same path. Yeah, and that was the basis of your first memoir. Yeah. And then you go on to discuss, uh, you know, your daughter's battle yeah. uh, with the same disease, you know, in the second memoir, mm -hmm. um, and you know, to see it go through your family like that must have been very tough. Um, I mean, we can't even imagine. It's awful how we become in denial, mm -hmm. the same as an alcoholic. Yeah. Alberta, do you think that the drinking was going on during those first three years, but you just didn't notice it, or did he hide it from you? Well, you know, it's funny, Tom, because he didn't actually drink at home. Mm -hmm. And like I said, he didn't drink with family. So I couldn't understand mm -hmm. why it was just, I didn't understand alcoholism. I came from a very close-knit family. Nobody worried about drinking. I'm not saying no one drank at our home. My father was in the service, and he had a lot of uh, couples up that were in the army with him, and they drank, but I never saw anybody get drunk. So I didn't know how to, what was happening, the confusion and the fear and the abuse, because it didn't, because I let it go on too long. Not that I'm using the, the I don't want to sound like an enabler. I mean, uh, Richie got abusive because of the drinking, but there's a certain responsibility I think the non-drinker has to take. Yeah. I never should have let 14 mm -hmm. years of my daughters going through this. and. Um, like I said, you just make it worse for the uh, alcoholic because they don't have to be responsible for their actions because you're covering up for them. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your latest book, What Is and Isn't Working for the Alcoholic and Addict, um, I know that you have uh, brought in several people that have also battled alcoholism and addiction <coughs> and told their stories and you know let them try and say what did and didn't work for them. Um, but you, you know, so certainly because you've already done the two memoirs, you leave out a lot of your own story. Um, I know you put it in, in, in the preface a little bit, yeah. um, but it's also nice to, um, you know, see it from the addict's point of view. Well, um, the reason I came to that is it was just 
one day early in the beginning mm -hmm. of last year, I was sitting there and of course meet a parent mm -hmm. who goes through the pain and I went through all the questions, what if, why didn't I, what I could have done. And then I started thinking, why is it? Because when I give talks at different mm -hmm. halfway homes and whatnot, and you see some of them that are recovering, I say, why is it that some addicts and uh, alcoholics can get over this? Mm -hmm. um, addiction that they have and others like Laurie and Richie die from it. Yeah. So I says, I'm going to go to the right source, which is the alcohol. Mm -hmm. That was an amazing. I've never seen that before uh, in a book, that it was strictly written by people who have had sub substance abuse yeah. problems. Yeah. And uh, they've all pretty much recovered. The ones that are in the book are in recovery. And so. they all had, you know, a different take on how their recovery, mm -hmm. you know, went and what really worked for them. Right. Some of them it was, you know, meetings and mm -hmm. AA, and some of them that was, you know, didn't help them at yeah. all. And it was, mm -hmm. they didn't truly feel like they were better until they didn't need the meetings and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Well, I'll tell you the reason why I ended up with 34 mm -hmm. people that replied back that they wanted to tell the story and I had to turn a lot away to them. How many people hung up on you like I did? <laughs> <laughs> but the reason that I actually, the reason I actually wanted a lot because I wrote my two books and I don't consider them memoirs, the other books, I consider them lessons because I swallowed my pride and I talked about what actually happened behind closed doors in an alcoholic family. But Laurie, when she was at Butler Hospital, she said to my husband, Al, and I at the time, she says, you know, Ma, I just listened to a man in his 70s talk for over an hour, and I could just not relate to him. Mm -hmm. So when I was writing this book, I thought, I need a lot of contributors, mm -hmm. because everybody handles something differently. And if a person can pick up what is and what isn't working for the alcoholic, they have 34 people to relate to. Someone might say, mm. that's me. And the nice thing about it is you have a contact information in the book for, like, there's a couple of people in there that I read about that I, I just have to message them and tell them how much their story meant to me. Yes. And some of them are darn good writers, yeah. too. Oh, yeah. um, but I want people to know, too, mm. Tom is uh, one of the contributors to the book. Yeah. I'm very happy to have Reluctantly I was. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them about why. Oh God, when she called me and says, I'm writing a new book and I want you to contribute to it. And uh, I was flattered. At fr and then she says, yeah, the title is <laughs> what's work, what's not, what is and what isn't working for the alcoholic and addict. I took offense, of course, because in my mind, I've never had a drinking problem or a substance abuse problem. So I pretty much, like I said, almost <laughs> hung up on her and I was, I was pretty much insulted. Mm -hmm. But she was nice and she just says, well, I just thought you might want to write about some of the experiences. And after that phone call, I thought about it for days. It bugged me that somebody would call me and say something like that. And then I realized that, you know something? Alberta read my memoir. Mm -hmm. She knows about my past. So you are right in saying that yeah, I caused problems with my drinking. Well, that's that's the reason I wanted yeah. someone like you yeah. because I don't think Tom was a well, I don't know if he has to answer for himself what people would call a full blown alcoholic. No, but he wants people to realize <clears throat> that you don't have to be exactly to have problems. In I mean, I wouldn't even want to sniff a drink if I went out on a Friday night and overdid it, but I might have totaled a car that night, or I got into a fist fight at some bar, or I mean. I, it's just normal things that you would never do if you weren't drinking. Right. So I might drink on weekends, but I could kill somebody that weekend. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a drinking problem. Yep. And that's mm -hmm. what I brought to the book, is that other aspect, that you don't have to be a full-blown textbook alcoholic in order to cause problems and end families and, you know, yeah, and, and you change know, lives. All sorts of unintended yeah. consequences. I was just darn lucky that I didn't kill anybody during those years. And I know that some people that come to this event chances are, have ended up hurting somebody because of their drinking and everything. And they haven't been as lucky. Or even if they, you know, don't think that they're hurting anyone, as I'm sure, you know, your husband and your daughter yeah. especially, they didn't think that they were hurting anyone with their drinking. Mm -hmm. But clearly, you know, it's, it's hurt you, it's hurt oh, yeah. the entire family. When I gave a talk at um, the Gosnell in Falmouth, mm -hmm. oh gosh, there must have been, seriously, 30 women and young teenagers there. And after I talked, I heard one girl say to another, I never knew 
we did that to our families. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you don't also want the substance abuser to carry guilt. Right. You just want them to be aware of what's happening to them. And um, so we're hoping to get the public involved with this is I'd like Tom and I to talk about, I have an event coming up on February 6th on a Thursday night here, right here at the Lakeville Library, six to eight. And I'm having Tom, and I'm also having Phil Paliogas from the WBSM radio show. And he tells his life story, and he's really more the full-blown alcoholic side. And after Tom and Phil talk, I'm going to come back and talk about how the family is affected. Because it's not just the drinker. In fact, I had a small breakdown because what I was doing was pushing my body and my mind <laughs> beyond what it could take trying to control someone to give something up. So we want this event to be really for, I've even invited directors of uh, rehabs to mm -hmm. come, uh, counselors, doctors, because this book, when they read it, there are, what the alcoholics are trying to do, I think, is to show new ways of handling addiction. Mm -hmm. Because you can't treat everybody as a number. And I'm not a professional, so this is just my opinion. I think they all should study more why a person mm. is using more than the, I call it a disease myself. Some of the people would argue with right. it being a disease, but I call it a disease because I saw it through the past of so many in Rich's family. But um, it's, I really hope people even bring their, their teenagers. Mm -hmm. That would be important. Yeah. Yes, because reading this book, we have one contributor that started drinking at five, one at yeah. seven. Yeah, unbelievable. So mm -hmm. it shows, and a lot of it, I don't want parents to feel guilty, but a lot of it, you're going to see that what children go through young mm -hmm. is how they're molded. You live what you, you learn. You learn what you live. I mean, basically, yeah, is what it is. Uh, I don't want you drinking with these kids. You're following the wrong crowd. Mm. Meanwhile, on the weekend, they have friends over, and they're all yeah. falling mm -hmm. all over the place. Mm -hmm. you, you have to be a model yeah. for your children when it comes to drinking. And I got to say, that was one of the most compelling stories I found in there was, you know, the mother who tried to be a friend to her daughter mm -hmm. when her daughter really needed that role model to stand up and yeah. you know, let her know that her drinking was a problem mm -hmm. and she didn't need to keep going down that road. Well, I, I find myself, it's it's not easy to admit right. your weaknesses, yeah. but let's face it, I'm a, a lot older than I was in the 70s mm -hmm. and I had to lose Richie and Laurie. And in my other two books, I really talk openly. Mm -hmm. I feel the mistakes that I made. Not that I will ever carry guilt that I made them, mm -hmm. but I... Because well, you know that's not true, even no. from leading these other people's yes. stories. Uh, oh, this is the similarities, this is what the, yeah. I have to bring up. I didn't mean to break no, no, your, your train of thought there, but there are so many similarities. There were three or four that jump out at you when you read this book that are common to each person. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to give away, you know, you can, you're going to talk about it when you have the event. But one of them, that they just don't feel like they're hurting them, their own body. Yeah. When they, it doesn't even occur, to, never occurred to me that, you know, that you were hurting yourself by overdoing. Laurie, you know. I, I can't say what somebody feels inside. I'm only talking from what I saw and experienced. I don't really believe that alcoholic and drug users want to stay in this condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it gets to a point where, because Laurie said to me once, you may think this is crazy, Ma, but I, the best time of my life is when I was drinking. <laughs> and I said, you know, Laurie, I believe you that that's how you felt. Yeah. But look what it's done to you. And that's what happens with these young kids in school. Either they've lost the security in themselves, the confidence. They want to follow the crowd, which they think is pretty hip, which meanwhile they're not. Mm -hmm. Or it could be hereditary. Mm -hmm. Or my other feeling is um, they may just want to follow the crowd, mm -hmm. but it's also deep-rooted problems. And Laurie's, I can talk about it because it's in the book, I'm not proud of it, but. 
there were a lot of mistakes I made when Laurie was a teenager, but we didn't know till she was 37 she had a problem because she, she followed the crowd as a mm. teenager in her senior high school, but then all of a sudden it changed. And from the time she got married till she was 37, nobody, mm -hmm. nobody in the family, I have another daughter, Debbie, she's four years old, and even she didn't know her sister had a problem. So they can hide it. Laurie was always a lady. Mm -hmm. Even when she drank, she never stumbled, she never got foul mouth or, mm -hmm. or anything. She was just a lady. So I said to <clears throat> Debbie, how did you not know your sister had a drinking problem? She said, Mom, we all drank. So nobody knew mm -hmm. that somebody had a problem. Yeah. So it, but I think it's, this is such a worldwide problem. It's a scary, the numbers, when you see millions of people <laughs> that are closet drinkers. It was on the news last night. I don't know if you noticed. No, I uh, didn't yeah. see that. It was talking about millions. Oh, yeah. For some reason, I, I think substance abusers are ashamed. Mm -hmm. But I think they should hold their heads up high. Seriously, yeah. because it, it's a disease mm -hmm. they have or it's an action that they're doing. But whatever, that's what I'm talking about with doctors. Mm -hmm. Find out why is this person needing mm -hmm. this drink or this drug? Um, and I just found out one of my nephews in the family has been fighting five years with heroin, and I, they're having an awful time. This poor boy has yeah. been in and out mm. at least five times, and he he did something Laurie didn't. He went to his parents wanting help. Hmm. Laurie didn't. But it goes to show how strong this drug is, mm -hmm. because even wanting the help, mm -hmm. he's struggling with getting over this. That's amazing that he seeked help from yes. heroin from his own parents because having experienced with uh, some heroin addicts in the past, they'll steal from their parents. Oh, Laurie stole from the she I mean, about it. Yeah. They'll do all kinds of things, but never go to have help from their parents. Right. So I never heard of that before. No, Laurie uh, joked with me when she was alive and she said, Ma, why do you think I always wanted to go grocery shopping for you when I got my life? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I'm such. A trusting person. That's what parents when do. Put, when she put the change on the table, yeah. I didn't go. Oh, no. Let's the bill that now. You figure you can trust your own yeah, kids. She's mine. You know, you have to. From you and her girlfriend. I shouldn't give a name, but her girlfriend that she was close to. She was like a daughter to me. She jokes that they did the same thing. They, you know, they mm. used to laugh and say, "We used to say we went here, we went there," and now she is in about the fifth time to her alcoholic rehab, I said, you girls just handled it wrong. You look for fun in the wrong places, <laughs> the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that's something, you know, we can uh, e expound on and actually, um, you know, teach to the people that are able to make it out to uh, uh, your talk here on uh, February 6th uh, from 6 to 8 here at the Lakeville Library. Mm -hmm. Well, I really hope everybody, no matter if you're the drinker, if you think you have a problem, or if you're a family member and you're going insane like I did on how to help them, please come to this event. We have mm -hmm. Phil and we have Tom talking. We're going to have all sides mm -hmm. for you to look at. Honestly. And if they want to find details about it, they can look at your website or my website. Yes. We have it posted on both of them. Yes. What's your website? Mine is just my name, which isn't easy. <laughs> w. Alberta Sequera. Dot com. And it's also on mine at theconstantoutsider.com. So. And you can definitely uh, pick up a copy of what is and isn't working for the alcoholic and addict. Uh, they have copies here, and I'm sure you'll have copies available at the uh, yes, talk I'll as be, well. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, you can also, uh, Tom's piece is in here as well, mm -hmm. but you can also read a more in-depth uh, story, The Constant Outsider, his memoir, or um, Alberta, you also have uh, two memoirs yes. discussing your personal issues. I'll have mm -hmm. those books available mm -hmm. here, too. Yep. And all my books, and I think Tom's, too, they're all in Kindle. So if yeah. somebody oh. doesn't want the paperback, they can get mm -hmm. it in Kindle. Yeah. Well, you hear that, folks? You can pick it up right now and uh, have it read before you get here. <laughs> so thank you all very much for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you here February 6th. Thank you, Al. Thank you.